Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Wedding Biz. I'm your host, Andy Kushner. A little bit tired today because I just spent two and a half days, very intense days in New York City, where I interviewed some amazing people. Party planner and designer Norma Cohen, great conversation. The incredible photographer Christian Oth, Ooh, that was a good one. And Julie Sabatino, who is the stylish bride, have a very exciting announcement about her coming up soon. And I also sat down a second time with Preston Bailey. And we released part one of Preston Bailey. We re-released it a few weeks ago. You could catch it. And we're going to get to it in the next month or so. Another incredible conversation with Preston. And very soon, we are going to be making a really big announcement about the wedding biz, a whole new thing that we're going to be uh, bringing to you all to help bring more education and inspiration. So keep tuning in. That's coming very soon. And I want to urge you to not forget to listen to our follow-on episode every Monday uh, called The Next Level, in which my co-host, Melissa, and I tease out some of the highlights to help break them down and deliver specific tactics to help you raise your business to the next level. So today you will be listening to my conversation with celebrity chef Roy Yamaguchi. This is a good one, everybody. I interviewed him at one of his, I was lucky to interview him at one of his many incredible restaurants, the Humble Market Kitchen, on the island of Maui at the Wailea Beach Resort. And Roy is a founder of a collection of restaurants, and he's really revered for his culinary skills and is known as uh, the innovator of Hawaiian-inspired cuisine. It's going to be interesting to hear him talk about that. Uh, it's an eclectic bent blend of California, French, Japanese cooking traditions, but I want you to hear him talk about it. Um, he's also received numerous prestigious awards, and I wanted to have him on The Wedding Biz because Roy's story is one that all of us can relate and learn from. He is a culinary artist, as I said, with a love for creating community that is so important to him, and it's really interested interesting how he built that into into his story creating his his empire and he's built a very successful one at that from the ground up and scaled to incredible proportions we talk a lot about that we talk about how he came to be an innovator how he feels about that how he's developed a sense of fearlessness how he scaled his business and how he creates a sort of subculture within the environment of his restaurants that's really interesting because we need to do that within our business and for our clients so there's a real connection there and we also talked about finding inspiration and why being relevant is more important than money for Roy so enjoy my conversation with Roy Yamaguchi So, Roy, thank you for doing the show. As you know, I just had a wonderful tasting. I had four dishes, and I'm going to put everything in the show notes with pictures and description. And, of course, the most recent one that's on my mind is the last dish I had, the mahi-mahi potato-crusted uh, over risotto with truffles, mushrooms, lobster sauce. Am I giving a good description of it? Yeah, very well, yes. Oh, God. Delicious. Yeah, I'm so upset because, you know, it was my fourth dish. So by the time I got to it, I couldn't finish the whole thing. But I got to tell you a story. So I, I guess we met really briefly. April of last year, I came to your grand opening. I had a wonderful meal, of course, and I get to the dessert table later, you know. Okay. Course, yeah, right, you remember right, this. Right. Yes, oh, yes. And I'm standing there. I mean, the meal was already blew me away. And it, we're going to come back to this, but it also you know, created this sense of community. We're going to come back to sharing this this meal together, of course. And so at the dessert, I was like, I could barely stand. My knees were shaking. The food was so good. I get very affected by wonderful food and desserts. And across the table from me is this local musician, Marty Dredd. And both of us on our faces were just like <laughs> melting, right? from It was, I wish I could remember, it was one of the chocolates like filled with something. And both of us, this is how we met was because of the dessert. We were both uh, just loving it like again like melting and we started to share our experience of the food and our experience of the dessert and literally that's how we started to bond you know again, i get like to hear know. that yeah exactly yeah you know what i mean i know that's part of what this well, is all about yeah you know what or it's it's to me you know food is an international language you know a lot of people can by sharing you know meals together can really open up their hearts and uh you know one of the things that even the State Department does uh -huh. is um, they have a program where they like to um, uh, have chefs come and to create meals for certain dignitaries where, you know, 
they can make these meals where, you know, it gives an opportunity for people to start talking and have dialogue. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so, it's so you know, to me, food has been very, very important in my life. And, and of course, you know, I want to be able to share those moments with everybody else. Do you remember, I mean, I know, you know, you've done a lot of interviews, TV shows, all of that, and that'll be in the show notes too, but you've talked extensively about your parents and your grandparents, your grandfather, and I believe the Humble Market Kitchen where we are today at the Wailea uh, Beach Resort in Maui is, I-, I heard, maybe a tribute to your grandfather? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, my, my grandfather uh, in the early 1900s left Japan. He's from an area called Fukushima. And he traveled and he ended up actually on Maui. And he started to work on the plantations and uh, worked for a while on actually on the plantations. And, and, uh, he and he and his, uh, his, his wife, my grandmother, had uh, 11 kids. You know, they would all kind of take care of each other while my grandparents worked on the plantation. Yeah. And sooner or later, uh, in the early 40s, with everything he did, my grandfather actually opened a restaurant, and then he ended up having about two or three. I mean, we're not really sure exactly how many restaurants he had, mm-hmm. but uh, we believe that he had some sort of a tavern-type restaurant Yeah, and, uh, you know, feeding the plantation workers. Oh, here on the island, uh, right? Oh, he, yeah. Here on Maui, yeah. yeah. And, and his restaurant was probably located somewhere in from Wailuku to uh, Kihei. Okay. Uh, we're not sure exactly which location. Everybody kind of forgets. Yeah. Uh, you know, all, it's all the kids. So, and then he had some sort of a Simon or some sort of a noodle restaurant. And and then in the uh, 50s, uh, getting out of the restaurant business, he actually went into the uh, the market business. So, he had a, a general store. Okay. And uh, he had, a, re- uh, he had a, a market called the Yamaguchi General Store. So, to me, you know, food has been a, a very important factor. And the Humble Market Kitchen was kind of like a tribute to my grandfather because yeah, of that. Yeah, that's really nice. So, you know, I, I heard the story about you at first signing up, I think, in high school for a home economic class to, to meet girls, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, yeah. Or, or, well, that's <laughs> a good what, way, good, 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 a good way to meet girls. Well, what happened was my a good friend of mine, his name was Jesse, because I went to an American school in Japan. Uh, basically, it's it's a uh, Department of Defense, you know, uh-huh. DOD school, yeah. uh, inside of an Army base, U.S. Army base. So my father was stationed. Uh, you know, he, he went to uh, Japan. One day, a friend of mine comes up to me and says, "Hey, Roy, you know, we should really take home Mac." <laughs> so I told him, I said, what's home mech? And he goes, don't worry about home mech. We're going to meet a lot of girls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, naturally, he met a lot of girls, but not me. I didn't. I just, I just kind of like fell into cooking and, and I really enjoyed it. Well, but going into that, I mean, so if you were in high school, you're like in your teenage years. What about before that, giving your family history? I mean, how? what was your personal attitude about food? Was it just there or did you already have something special going on? You know what? It was already uh, it was already there. So, you know, I, I have to say that, um, you know, my father, so my, so my grandfather, when we used to visit my grandfather here on Maui, my grandfather used to always cook for us. And uh, he would take us to, you know, different farms and and, and we would visit a bunch of stuff, you know, people, et cetera, on island. Uh, but at home in Japan, my father did most of the cooking. Oh, my, it, yeah. Is that a cultural thing or is that just you in know, your it's, family? It's just that I think I think it's because my father, you know, used to help my grandfather uh-huh. uh, in the kitchen yeah. when he was younger. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he really enjoyed cooking. Uh, and um, as kids, you know, my father would always take us to different ports in Japan, yeah, and he would take us to different markets, and he was always looking for, you know, fresh fish and you know what's available. So earlier on in life, you know, I was kind of like uh, in that environment. Yeah. So so of course when I grew up, you know, that's the kind of things that um, you know got accustomed to, and you know my grand uh, my father would always cook the meals at home. Yeah. So every every night it was, it was basically kind of a ritual uh, during the weekday. My father would come home after work. My mother would have some sort of a um, kind of an appetizer, you know, a poo-poo ready for my father. And, um, you know, usually something called tsunomono, which okay. is, you know, something that's kind of like a, a, a little dish that's kind of vinegary. Yeah. No, you know, usually it was kind of like octopus, sliced octopus mm-hmm. with the cucumbers, you know, marinated in rice wine vinegars, you know, a little sugar, uh, a little salt. 
So my father would pick on that, and he would read the paper uh, and, you know, have a glass of beer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, relaxing, you know, winding down. And then, and then you know, he would, I guess at that time, he would think about what he was going to make for dinner. Okay. And then, and then, and then, you know, after he's done with all of that, he would start, you know, preparing dinner for us. And, you know, then we, then we had dinner. So my father was the one that cooked maybe, you know, five times a week, uh, whatever came to mind. And then when my mother would cook, you know, she's from Okinawa. Okay. So she made, you know, some of her favorite, you know, Okinawan dishes. Uh -huh. So, you know, it, it was kind of, you know, pretty cool, you know, living at home and, you know, seeing my parents cook, you know, throwing the baton every <laughs> now and then and, uh, you know, changing it up. But I'm also thinking how you were just talking about how, you know, your father would come home, I guess, from work, right? Obviously, he'd come back from work. He'd sit down, have the beer, have, have the octopus cooked that way. And I'm just thinking as a young boy, you're noticing that's part of his transition into relaxing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, I mean, well, obviously you know what I mean, but, <laughs> but, but it's, <laughs> but it's more than just, no, I okay. kept my eyes open in case, you know, I had, I had some bad grades and I would turn around and figure out when I should give him my report card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to do it. Um, but yeah, so it's interesting because right from the beginning, it's more than just flavor and it's more than, you know, taking the edge off the appetite. It, it's like, this is his way of easing into the evening. Yeah, you know what it's yeah it is because you know and that's probably one of the one of the early uh, you know hints I got about you know what food really does to people mm. you know seeing them relax and en kind of enjoying it you know and um, you know my mother would be happy and she would you know feel good about making something for him and then he would enjoy it in turn by him enjoying it he would think about something to make for us yeah so you know it's kind of a a good trickle down effect, I guess. Yeah. That's, so I know that at 19, you went to the CIA, culin <laughs> different CIA, the Culinary Institute of America. What What were you thinking then? Because in high school, like, what were your passions? What were you doing during that time? Well, it was kind of interesting because, you know, I took home ec when I was about 16. Like, uh, I guess a course, you know, I mean, you had to take some uh, courses, you know, like home ec, I guess, you know, was one of the electives that you can take. But there was like a wood shop or something, and there was yeah. like an electronic class. The same as my high school. We must okay. be close to the same age, exact same choices. <laughs> so, 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 I, so I took wood shop, and, and I wasn't that good. <laughs> and then I took electronics, and you know, I almost blew up the, uh, the classroom. <laughs> so that was kind of like out of off off limits. But I really enjoyed cooking. Uh huh. So because you know, uh, again, uh, you know, going back to see my father cook, and then uh, you know, at the same time when my friends came over when I was younger, yeah. Um, you know, maybe say 12, you know, 12 or, you know, maybe 13, maybe even younger. Um, you know, my friends would come over and, you know, my dad had this, you know, teriyaki sauce. Yeah. Uh, in the refrigerator. Okay. And, you know, his teriyaki was really good. Yeah. So I would make, you know, my friends like teriyaki chicken or, you know, it's something that's very, very easy to make and I would grill it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even back then, you know, I, I, I saw myself. You know, spending a lot of time, you know, cooking for my friends. Yeah, you know, huh. When my parents would go out or something and they would be, you know, gone, you know, we always had like, um, you know, some sort of a, like a sausage or, you know, like a pepperoni in the refrigerator. And, you know, I would always kind of pan fry that up and eat it with <sighs> rice. Yeah. So, so stuff like that, you know, I was doing when I was, you know, uh, very young. So I think, you know, a combination of all those things with home ec kind of drew me to, you know, the food side. But that's a big step to say, okay, I'm going to go to to the Culinary Institute of America. Like, how how did that come about in your mind? What was the the? Well, I think one of the one of the things that really drew me to that during home ec class. Yeah, we did a luncheon, mm -hmm. and we were told to cook whatever we like to do. Okay. You know, so, you know, we had, maybe we had a choice of hamburger or turkey or whatever it was. And I actually make, made a uh, roast turkey. Okay. So I made a roast turkey, made some stuffing. I can't remember what kind of stuffing I made, but, you know, I'm guessing that it was a pretty much, you know, one of those, you know, Betty Crocker, you know, uh, you know, yeah, just bread thing. Yeah. And then you throw water in it or something. Yeah. And, you know, well, still, <laughs> still <laughs> probably more complicated than most of the other boys in that class. I mean, come on. <laughs> so, so, so I made, you know, I made some stuffing and I, I roasted a turkey and, and I invited my school counselor. Oh, brilliant. As my guest. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, you know I, I had to get on the good side of him. Right. So, so I invited my school counselor and he, and he goes, Hey Roy, 
I think you got a knack for this. Huh? And he goes, you know, your turkey's pretty good. <laughs> and he goes, your stuffing's not bad too. So, you know, really not thinking anything of it. Uh, you know, maybe a week or two later, he called me into his office and he goes, hey, Roy, you know what? I really think that he should pursue this cooking thing. Wow. And he's the one who actually got all the information, um, you know, later on about a school back then. I didn't mm-hmm. know, you know, anything about cooking schools. But, you know, he, he looked it up and he goes, there's a, there's a great school called the Culinary Institute of America. Yeah. He goes, I think it just moved from um, from New Haven, Connecticut to Hyde Park, New York. Hmm. If you're really interested, I, I'll get you the information. Uh-huh. And he got me all the information. And before, you know, I knew it or anybody knew it, I was on track wanting to go to cooking school and, and put in the application, got accepted, there I went. Isn't it interesting, you know, synchronicity, serendipity, how it works? Like, what if you had not invited him? What if it wasn't him, right? It was another guidance counselor who yeah, thought of that? Well, yeah, you know what? It's uh, my, my life would be disastrous. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> well... I like to believe that we all kind of bring each what we need and who we need to to each other, you know. And but it's but it's you know you're you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, it's, it's so kind of, I mean, I mean, without this this kid Jesse, good friend of mine, without him saying, you know, let's take home Mac, without oh, inviting the school counselor. Yeah, I mean, because I would have never, never, ever taken home Mac because I didn't know what it was. Yeah. So you know, I I would have probably never taken home Mac, which would have never brought me to the point where I would have, you know, brought my school counselor. Yeah. And, and, and he's the one who did all the research. So it's, yeah, he's incredible. That. So what, 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 what had happened was, um, I left New York right when I turned like 20, I left New York, you know, cause it was a two year, two year program at school. So I think I was like 19 and a half, 20 ah, years old. Okay. That, that when I left uh, New York and that went to Los Angeles yes, yes. and, and then I ended up getting a job at the um the Beverly Hilton Hotel. Wow. And, and it was it's pretty interesting because when uh, I went around looking for a job and I found this job, you know, it's over at the uh, Beverly Hilton and then I started working for this uh, chef in this restaurant called the Escoffier Room, okay. which was a very very um you know, high class, you know, French cooking, you know, very very traditional French style cooking yeah. and an environment. So I got a job there and I was uh, so happy. And and I was um, making green beans into <laughs> string beans. <laughs> okay, yeah. I was putting this green, uh, whole green bean into this machine and crank it yeah. by hand and it becomes a string bean. Right, right. So I was doing that and I was making these potatoes called potato, potato Anna with uh, layered with potatoes and truffles. And I thought it was pretty cool. So I was working there and then after about a week, the chef goes, Roy, I got some bad news. I said, what's the bad news? He goes, you can't work here anymore because, um, you know, I didn't hire you. You you're, you're actually were hired to replace somebody else, but the person's coming back. But the good news is that if you want to still work in this hotel, you know, you can go downstairs and work, you know, cooking breakfast. Hmm. So I said, well, you know, I, I really had my heart set on, you know, doing this type of food. Yeah. So, you know, make long story short, I went to go look for another job and I ended up working in a country club and, you know, serving food on the buffet line. And, you know, I was still looking around and looking around and finally got a job at this uh, Scandinavian restaurant that, you know, ma- making great sandwiches and all that stuff. So doing all of that. And then I ended up working at this French restaurant, uh, another French restaurant called the um, L'Hermitage. And, and back in the... Uh, uh, the late eighty, uh, late seventies, uh, uh, when I started at L'Hermitage, they were considered the fourth best restaurant in the U.S. My God, the chef there was a chef uh, owner of the restaurant, uh, John Bertrandu, was uh, you know his friends were like Paul Bocuse, mm. you know, who just recently passed away, and uh, Roger, uh, Roger Verger, and uh, um, you know the, the Trois Gros brothers and Mich- wow, so, big names, yeah, big names. You know, yeah. back in the uh, back in the seventies, mm-hmm. and um, I ended up working at L'Hermitage. Wow, and uh, it was a great experience and working there for two and a half years, uh, meeting all these great chefs from all around the world. Uh, you know, mainly French French chefs, and then um, you know, from from that point on, after about two and a half years there. Back in uh, in the early '80s, I was able to get a my first job as a as a chef. Mm. 
And that led to me working in another uh, restaurant um, at the airport, uh, LAX, um, over at the Sheridan LAX. There was a restaurant called Le Gourmet. Okay. And I ended up being the chef there. And, you know, that kind of opened my the doors to opening my first restaurant, mm-hmm. which was in 1984. Uh, I, I opened this restaurant called um, 385 North. Okay. And this restaurant was... You know, my it was my style of cooking. You know, back then. You know, uh, unfortunately, it didn't last too long. But uh, that, that was my first real experience, and you know, having a partnership in a restaurant mm. and, and the uh, business side, right? And, yeah, the handling business the business side, side. and um, you know, creating foods that you know that were dear to me. Yeah, it was my you know my own style of cooking. So. So when did you then start a restaurant that let's quote unquote became successful for you? So 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 the 385 North was a, was my first restaurant and and you know I think far as food goes you know I think we were very 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 successful. It's just that business wise we weren't you know you know that good. Yeah. So my partners and I and you know we just didn't didn't do the right thing. But um in 1988, which led, you know, so, so, you know, we closed the restaurant in 87, which led me to move to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. So I moved to Hawaii in 1987. And why? Why did you decide to do that? Okay. Uh, the reason why I did that was because I had, you know, my cousin who lived in Hawaii at that time um, had called me up and said, hey, Roy, you know what? You should really consider opening a restaurant in uh, Hawaii because, um, you know, there's this building that I drive by every every morning, hmm. uh, you know, when I go to work, and I think it would be a great uh, place for you to have a restaurant. Uh-huh. So, so that's why you know, in the early uh, in early 1987, you know, I came to Hawaii, uh, and then you know, kind of scoped it out, and I thought the location was kind of magical. You know, sometimes yeah. to me, you know, restaurants you have a feel. You know, the when, environment, when you, right? Yeah, you, you, you know, you walk in somewhere into a building or whatever it may be, mm-hmm. or or you stand on a street corner, and you sometimes you get this feeling that hey, you know, this might this this might be a great place to yeah. have a restaurant. Yeah. So I came to Hawaii, and I and 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 you know, specifically to Hawaii Kai, where this where we opened our first restaurant, the first Roy's. Mm-hmm. As I stood there, I go, wow, you know, this feels pretty good. Went into the building and kind of spent time there. You know, I just, I just had a good feeling mm-hmm. about that space. And and so I ended up opening the first Roy's in that space. And, you know, everybody that I talked to in Hawaii, just about every person I talked to when it came to, you know, an architect or a contractor or anybody that knew anything about restaurants told me not to open there. Really? They said, do not open there because you'll fail. Whoa. You'll fail because the neighborhood that I picked to put the first Roy's in was in a residential area. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a residential area where people didn't really go to. Okay. I mean, they would live there. I got you. But yeah. But, but when they would eat and go out and eat, mm-hmm. they would actually drive out of that neighborhood and go somewhere else. Hmm. But I wanted to be in that neighborhood because I felt that I wanted to really build a, a community based I see. restaurant yes tying in what we were talking about earlier about I, the experience of eating and sharing i want to be in a neighborhood where i felt that you know i can be a part of that community yeah and 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 if i succeeded the community would be proud of what i was doing and i wanted to hire individuals from that community ah you know so i wanted everything tied back to community to give to the community to be a part of the community to be a good, you know, citizen of that community. So, you know, the Hawaii Kai area was was a very, very, uh, like a bedroom community. Mm-hmm. But but that's where I wanted to be. Well, so Roy, you know, I'm curious, like you were talking about how everyone's telling you it's going to fail. And I read somewhere in some interview, you said, I've always had a lot of determination. So I get that. But with that comes... I don't know if it's a sense of fearlessness. I mean, I like to talk about, you know, leaping off the cliff and assuming that net is going to appear. Like, what is it for you that you were able to, and still at a relatively young age, and you had already had that one business that didn't really work out business-wise. What do you think it is about you that was able to say, I'm going to do this and to come out with this idea of community? Well, I just think, a total yeah, gut thing. Well, no, I, th- I think I think well, a couple of things. I think you know, again, um, going back to my childhood, I was I was raised, I was born and raised on an army base in Japan. 
Okay. So it's a small base, and where we lived was on base. So again, it's a it's a it's a tight community. I see. Yeah. It, it, everything was you know even though Japan is you know I mean it's it's an island and is you know relatively you know there's a lot of people living there. When you live on base, it's just a small community. Well, it's like a subculture, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's like a subculture. And what you have there is, you know, you have, you know, you have a high school and you have a middle school. Mm. And, you know, you kind of grew up with, the, well, to a certain extent, you grew up with the same people. But yet, of course, the military is always changing, right? They're coming in and out. Mm-hmm. But yet, the school is always there. So, you know, so it was kind of like, to me, a very, very tight-knit community. And, you know, what you do, you know, everybody knows kind of kind kind of, yeah. of deal. So... So when I opened that restaurant in Hawaii Kai, you know, the first Roy's, um, I wanted that same kind of feeling. And, and I think that feeling stuck to me. And with the failure of the, the restaurant 385 North, mm-hmm. you know, that I had opened previously, you know, it kind of opened my eyes to what I didn't do or uh, what I should have done. Yeah. So again, that was very, very important. And at that time, it's important to say that um, there was a, uh, a TV show on uh, during that time, and um, it was Cheers. Okay. And I used to watch Cheers, and I used to always go, wow, that's pretty cool, because, you know, you always had, uh, I think his nor- name was Norm, you know, on the show, but he had two individuals that always sat there and drank beer. That's right. <laughs> among everybody else. Yeah. But, you know, it was a place where everybody got together, mm-hmm. right? The bartender knew. Yeah. You know, his, his, his customers or her customers. Um, and, you know, I mean, it was kind of a, an environment where everybody was happy and, you know, they tell stories. This is so interesting. Yeah. So so I saw that and, and, and that, that always stuck to my mind. And, and when I opened... 385 North, you know, I knew that I was missing that. Okay. And I lacked that. So I wanted to make sure that whatever I did after 385 North, if I was able to do something again, you know, I said to myself, you know, I'm not going to make the same mistakes. And, you know, what I want is a restaurant where it's a neighborhood. Mm. And um, everybody knows her, you know, each, you know, knows her names and, uh, you know, they feel comfortable and it was a place where they would gather. Yeah, it's like a home away from home kind of, right? Yeah, kind yeah. of like cheers. So how then, I mean, going from there, obviously it was successful for you to then scale your business and start opening businesses eventually all over the world. And in a minute, you know, a little bit, we'll get to TV shows and books and all of that. But as far as the restaurants, how were you able to take that community sense and expand it outward? Well, so, you know, what's important is that when I first opened the first Roy's, um, you know, I wanted people to work really close with me. And, and of course I wanted talent, Yeah. but at the same time, I, I, I chose the kind of people that I really wanted to work with. Like a mentor kind of a relationship? No, not really a mentor type relationship, but it was more of a, um, you know, if there was something that I lacked, Mm -hmm. you know, I wanted someone that was good at that. I see. So, you know. When we first opened the first Roy's, you know, I wanted somebody that was good in wines. Okay. I wanted somebody that was good in service. Mm. You know, I, I wanted somebody that was good in uh, business communications. I wanted somebody that were that was just as good as me when it came to cooking. Mm-hmm. So these are the individuals that I hired and said, "Hey, come work with me. We're going to try to work and, and and build something, you know, good." And, and that's and that's what I did. And although you're the owner, in a sense, together it's your team. Team. And having them feel invested in it too, I imagine. Exactly. So I wanted to create a, a team, a, a team that you know we can kind of like throw our ideas on. I, I'm telling you, in the very beginning, you know, uh, we used to uh, sit around after work uh-huh. and uh, you know, kind of like critique the night. Okay. And you know, and, and have a little cocktail and you know something a little bite to eat. And before you know it, it's, it's a sh- it's a shouting match. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Listen. <laughs> You got to have passion, right? The passion extends everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. I want that too. You know, in my team, oh, I have three teams because I have three, two podcasts and a, and a music business, but it's the same thing. I encourage them. It's like, speak up. I want to hear what you have to say. And I want you to have a voice and, and, you know, eventually compensate them in a way that also reflects that, you know, I want to have a team that, that right. helps take me. I, there was a time when I was not like a dictator, but I was weight controlling. And it was ironically, you know about this too, right? When you let go of control. Ah, now you can really grow. Right, right, right. And it's, you know, so, so exactly. And, and, and that's so, 
the second restaurant, um, getting back to that second restaurant, you know, how did it work out, et cetera, was because I had these individuals on my team, mm -hmm. you know, from the very, very beginning. So, you know, three years out is when we opened our second restaurant. You know, I had a pretty good, pretty, pretty tight knit team that kind of knew each other. And, uh, you know, we would work, would work with each other. And when we, and then we had some, you know, other individuals, you know, below us um that wanted to reach that same height yeah and um so you know we kind of divided the team okay and, and sent half the team to you know the, our second location uh, to open the second location i see and and so to me what's what's really important is the culture mm. you know the culture you create mm -hmm. and you know, i i truly believe that we had a very strong culture N not knowing that we did uh i i believe that we had a strong culture that kind of, you know, really bonded together. And with that second location, you know, the team members that went to the second location wanted to strive to make sure that culture was alive. Ah, and create a similar... And create that same environment. Yeah. The same feeling that that worked with worked for us at the first location. Mm -hmm. Can you, Are you able to put words to that, to, to how you would describe your culture... You know what? It's uh, it's kind of interesting because, you know, uh, later on, you know, I would say about, you know, if I had to guess, somewhere like 15 years after we opened the first Roy's, we actually um, were trying to, we were going to start um, opening locations, you know, the, on, on the mainland U.S., mm. you know, the continent of the U.S. So we started to open restaurants and we actually um, got involved and hired a um, a company mm -hmm. that that really deals with you know keeping cultures together. Okay. And um, you know branding. Branding. I was going to say defining the brand, and, right? And, so putting you know, words to yeah. it, so and, you can and, and, recreate and, and, it. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it was all about you know trying to you know, move our culinary culture was extremely important because, mm -hmm. you know, what it, it's a chef-driven concept. Yeah. Uh, the chefs are very, very important as anybody else, but the chefs were kind of like, you know, really guiding the ship because they were the ones that were creating menus yeah. and, you know, it was their identity, you know, that was reflected on the plate. So, um, you know, we try to carve out some, you know, some words, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's you know, it's, there, there really isn't, a um, uh, just you know one sentence that you can say you know it's, it was more about you know we had an eight page document uh -huh. like that, a mission statement kind well, of or a brand it, statement well it's 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 a uh, it's a principle statement okay and and it's all about you know what we do uh, what we try to achieve and who's important you know the who the stakeholders are mm. and. Um, and it's, you know, we call it the principles and beliefs of Roy's and it's called Roy's way. Ah, so, yeah, you know, you said and you said something a moment ago about people, you know, reflecting kind of who they are in the cooking. And you said, uh, quote, I love showing my personality in my cooking. Can you talk for a moment about that? Yeah. So, you know, what's, what was interesting was, you know, and, 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 and it's and it's from the very start, I think when I started to cook, I really enjoyed cooking mm -hmm. and and I started to, you know, infuse, you know, French cooking. Yeah. Because, because I really liked, and in the very beginning, I didn't really know why I liked French cooking. It's just that I just thought French cooking was the way to go. Okay. But when I started to work in a French restaurant, you know, I really enjoyed making sauces. Mm, I was going to yeah. say, that seems to be the centerpiece of a French So, yeah. Sauces. So, I started to make sauces and I really enjoyed making sauces. Uh -huh. And so, I worked with a chef uh, owner, John Bertrandu, and then I worked with his chef de cuisine, Michel Blanchet. And, you know, I was making sauces and, you know, he well, he taught me how to make sauces and I was able to be like his comi, the assistant. Yeah. And then, you know as a, you know, first cook, and then later on I became, you know, sous chef, mm. the assistant. Mm -hmm. So I love making sauces. And, you know, those things that I really enjoy doing, and I said to myself, geez, you know, I, sh I should really come up with my own style of cooking. Ah, uh, yeah. So I so that's when I started to infuse, you know, Asian flavors into French sauces and, okay. you know, all the 
traditional classical dishes that we might have made in the restaurant. I would try to duplicate that and add my own flair to it. Yeah. And I think that that's what made me, you know, want to create my own food. And then so I said to myself, you know, that's what should be really displayed on a plate. I see. The first time I really thought about that, you know, to 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 to, to a point was when um, Paul Schaefer came to um, to our restaurant, and you know, I made him dinner. Yeah. And then after after he had dinner, I went up, I went up, and I said, you know, Mr. Schaefer, did you enjoy your, you know, your 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 meal tonight? He mm-hmm. goes, he goes, you know what? I think I saw your personality on the plate. Whoa. I couldn't really say it in words, but, you know, at the same, you know, it's, after I heard that, you know, kind of put two to two together. Yeah. And I said to myself, you know, that's what I've been trying to do all my life uh, when it came to cooking. Yeah. Is to really put my personality in what I do and have it re- be reflected on the plate. That was really astute of him to, uh, you know, word it in that way. And, and you're credited with being the creator of Hawaiian fusion cuisine. Do you feel limited by that phrase, that definition? Because I, I feel you're more than that. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, exactly. You know, so, I mean, it's one of your successes, commercial successes, but it's just a piece, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think, I think you know, I mean, hey, listen, at the end of the day, I think, um, you know, my cooking is, is far beyond, you know, being... You don't want to be labeled just like a musician yeah, doesn't yeah, want to be labeled. Yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm more of an international. I mean, yeah. You know, basically, you know, I, I you know... Whatever that term may be, but you know, of course, uh, my style of cooking now is it's more about the inspiration. Uh huh. You know, it's the inspiration uh, being inspired by Hawaii, uh, but uh, but but definitely it's uh, internationally influenced. I get you know? it. Yeah. You know, it's 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 what I do. So for me, instead of saying that it's you know it's Hawaiian fusion. I think I like to say that it's it's uh, Hawaii inspired but mm. internationally influenced. Oh, I um, like that type of cuisine. I just want to take a moment and say in this conversation with Roy Yamaguchi, he talks about the importance of creating a sense of community. And isn't that the most important element at any event, particularly a wedding? And one of the most impactful ways of bringing everyone together under one roof to celebrate such a joyous occasion is having the right band who not only sounds and looks incredible, but this is really critical, knows how to connect with the crowd and facilitate them connecting with each other. Sound connection is that band. They have flown all over the world for incredible events, all kinds, luxury weddings, corporate, fundraising galas, shows in Vegas, you name it, they've done it all. And they know how to bring people together for one goal, whether that's love for a couple, supporting a fundraising cause, or the mission of a corporate client, Sound Connection knows how to do that. Learn more about Sound Connection at theweddingbiz.com forward slash sound connection. That's theweddingbiz.com forward slash sound connection. And now back to our guest, Roy Yamaguchi. You also um, said somewhere, um, I'm a believer that people are born with a sense of cooking. It's something within them that really gives them the ability to create and to understand flavors. Can you say more about that? Well, I think that, you know, you have, you know, to me, you know, to be creative, you have to be inspired and to, you know, have, you know, a love for food and to, um, because, you know, to me, it's, it's everybody, everybody and anybody, I think at some point in their life tries to cook and, you know, some people aren't good at it and then they say, ah, maybe I'm not good at it and they stop. But at the end of the day, when you really think about it, pretty much everybody on this earth enjoys their parents cooking. Hmm. That's interesting. And it's not because that it's good, but it's because it's done with love. Ah, yes. And care. Yeah. And, you know, it's It's nurturing. It's nurturing. So I think that food becomes a, a, um, to some extent, you know, a very big part in people's lives. Mm. And especially, you know, for cultures that really, you know, like maybe the Italian culture Uh or the French culture, you know, where food is a very, it's, 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 it's something that you do together, right? Yeah. Um, So, you know. Yeah, I get it. So you talked about needing to be inspired. How do you go about, is there a particular process when you create new dishes, you know, and, and 
how that inspiration happens and then how do you manifest it into well there's really no one way that i do things but um definitely when i see different things in life you know whether it be color or whether it be you know circumstances you know so i don't really design a dish or come up with a dish in the kitchen my inspiration just comes from whatever i do in life mm -hmm. and and i can be thinking you know, I can I, I can be just driving and all of a sudden come up with a dish because, yeah. you know, I think I think like a lot of chefs, you know, we have food banks. Yeah. So you know, whether it be vision or whether it be smell mm. or, or whether you know, um, there's something else to it. You know, w we have an idea about food and what we like and 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 um, you know how we can put all of this together. So we don't have to be behind a stove. Sure. So we create dishes as we, you know, drive or, you know, sitting on an airplane being bored or something. Yeah, right. So, so for me, the create, the, I get, I guess the inspiration comes when, when I see something and I go, wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Then I get motivated. Mm. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'm, I'm creating a dish because of that excitement that I've, you know, that I just went through. Do you literally like stop and take notes or you just retain this and, Eventually, you, know you get to the kitchen. Well, when I was younger, uh, I didn't have to take notes, but today, I forget <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah. I have to take notes. I relate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, is there any dish that, okay, let's say that you, you, you come up with this idea and, you know, you manifest it, but are there moments where you can't get to it? What sometimes happen is that, it happens is that, you know, I'll think of a great dish in my mind uh -huh. and- it just doesn't work. You know, I, I just, it just doesn't work. Hmm. And, you know, and, and I'll try it and try it. It just doesn't work. And, um, you know, I'll just throw it on the shelf and then, you know, later on I'll, I'll get back to it. Yeah. But, you know, there's, there's, there's incidents, incidents when, when, when something like that happens. Yeah. You know, I used to write songs and this was for years and years and years. And I, I would take notes and I wouldn't, and, you know, I would work on stuff and sometimes things would come very quickly. Other times it would be, you know, Eight years later, I'm working on one idea, and all of a sudden, bam, it connects, right, with an idea earlier that didn't quite work. I mean, is that, I'm assuming it's all kinds of things, but that's part of it, too. Yeah, exactly. You know, it just you just let it, and sometimes you, you, you just... <laughs> Got to let it marinate. Yeah, just, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Got to let it marinate. Just let it just go, and then think about it and come back later on. So, I want to ask you, too, what do you feel um, differentiates a great chef from a master? Well... You know, it's 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 kind of interesting because to me, you know, whether you're great or whether you're a master or whether you're just a cook, you know, to a certain extent, what's important to me is your heart. Mm. And, 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 and I really feel that if I can just answer it in this way, somebody that's a great cook mm -hmm. can relate to a lot of people. Okay. Sometimes you're a, a chef or a master chef, meaning that, you know, a lot of times, in, uh, in in the terms of you know someone being a master chef, it's about it's more it's technical. more than just the te okay it's it's technical yeah. and uh, and the art right? and the art itself. But you know a lot of it is you know you can be a chef and a and, and a master chef. I mean, people can say okay, you're a master chef or a chef, but to me, a master chef is more about someone that's more technical that knows really the technical stuff. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And and but at the same time, you have to understand that to me, uh, a great cook uh -huh. can can reach more people through his cooking mm. because sometimes what happens is you know chefs want to make food mm -hmm. that pleases them. Okay, but does that really please the public? Mm. But when you have a a great cook that can make people happy because he's just cooking something that's really good. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't uh -huh. have to be creative. Uh, it, but it moves you. But it moves you. Okay. And, and I think that, you know, those are the, the people that I really want to call masters because they're the ones who really create a joyful environment, mm. joyful, you know, evening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, chefs get too crazy so what do you tell aspiring chefs i mean that's a big question but it seems related to this i'm almost thinking one of the answers is to consider what you're talking about right it's not just the 
the ingredients and what you're mixing and all of this, it's really considering who. You know what? I like when I make my menus. I I, I look at the where I am uh-huh. and the type of guests I think that are going to walk through the doors. Uh, yeah. So location is extremely important where you live, and and I try to make food that number one I love to eat. Mm-hmm. Okay, no, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. It's all my style, mm-hmm. but I want to make sure that that I can make the locals happy. Yeah. You know, and to me, that's extremely important. You know, so again, getting back to the neighborhood, you know, we have a lot of restaurants that are in resort areas, but we do have restaurants that are in neighborhoods. Communities. Communities where, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we cook for the community. Mm. And of course, important to buy, you know, your local ingredients. Yeah. From that community. So, and support them and all of that too. Yeah. And reflected in the cooking, I understand. So I'm imagining when you travel, do you, I, so- do you also just take time and go travel? Like, what, what is your life like when it comes to that? I know you're you're so busy. There's so much going on. But do you just take time to get away and experience a culture and taste and eat and talk? Well, you know what? When I do travel and, you know, it's, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough in my life to where I've been over, you know, I've been to, you know, maybe close to 50 countries, you know, by yeah. now. Um, and, but, you know, I make it a point to really, dig in and learn more about the culture than anything else Mm -hmm. uh you know sightseeing of course is you know it's it's great but you know i I try to mingle and go into neighborhoods and you know and 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 get into a uh you know a local market yeah not a not a a grand market yeah right you know a real down home yeah yeah you're going to you know some funky neighborhood yeah and, and, and go into a grocery store and see what they have, uh, you know. And, and those are the type of environments I like. And sometimes when, when I visit my visit friends or or visit, you know, restaurants uh, or get asked to go to, you know, visit restaurants in different cities or different countries, I like to try and get a cook yeah. that works in a restaurant to take me to his house or uh, her house. Ooh, I like so, that. So, so that so, and, and, and have a meal uh-huh. that they may have. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's because to me, that's, you know, learning more about the culture. Ah, you know, what time should I put down to come at your house? And <laughs> 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 I bet that was a moment I'm taking yeah, advantage yeah, yeah. of. <laughs> so switching for a moment to mm, let's call it the commercial side of the business. I mean, branding is important. This is the world of social media and all of that. And you hosted, I believe, six seasons of the television show Hawaii Cooks with War Yamaguchi, which is. I think been seen in more than 60 countries. You've got three cookbooks and we're all, we're going to put this all in the show notes. How about managing that side of your, I hate to keep calling it brand, but that's, it's important, right? It's today's world. Yeah, it's, it's important. You know, it's, you know, you know, what's kind of unfortunate uh, that I think that, you know, when we first opened restaurants uh, or even when I worked at L'Hermitage, you know, got going back to, you know, 40 years ago or something, you know, you cooked great food and, uh-huh. you, and you provided great service mm-hmm. and your restaurant was full. You know, mm. I mean, I mean, people went to restaurants that were great yeah, or seeked out restaurants that were great. But today, for what, it, what it's worth, there's a lot of hype to, you know, a lot of restaurants. And, you know, if a restaurant doesn't have a certain height, you know, maybe that restaurant is not seen as a, uh, a place to go to. Mm. I mean, I know a lot of great restaurants where they have great food, mm-hmm. but, you know, uh, they're not as busy as some of the restaurants that are not so good, but yet they have a lot of hype. Yeah. So, you know, because now design is part of it. You know, someone who builds a restaurant with, with, with these, you know, bells and whistles uh-huh. compared to somebody that builds a pretty plain restaurant sometimes, you I know, love I mean, those too. So, yeah. you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's all these different angles and different types of things that, that adds up to, you know, what it ends up to be. But, um, you know, social media now it plays a big part, mm. and um, you know that's how people, you know, can hype their establishment, or you know, or or the establishment g- gets gets that hype and becomes extremely popular through those you know social media channels. Yeah. So you know, it, th- there's a lot going on now mm. where there wasn't before. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's good or bad, I don't know. I mean, that's you know, that's for the people that are extremely busy, it's good, and for the people that are not, I mean, you know. Maybe, you have to embrace it, don't you? You, you have to, and th- th- that's just the way life is today. And and you you know, there's there's a lot of good to it, I guess. I mean, mm-hmm. you can reach to a lot of people, or have the you know, you can you can go out and reach a lot of people without really doing too much. Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah. Whereas before, 
you know, it was about getting a magazine ad or, you know, being on a magazine or, you know, be more talked about in a magazine or, or, or maybe a news or news broadcast or something mm. on TV. You know, I, I want to come back to that in a moment, but I also want to ask you, you were making me think, so there's a, a trend, I call it a trend now, but I love it uh, for kind of health and wellness, you know, and how is that affecting the industry and, and your own work? I imagine it's a good thing for you, the way you, you cook, right? Well, I think it's a good thing because, you know, I mean, I mean, there's a lot more issues now than, than probably ever before, or it's just that it's, you know, people are more open to it. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of opportunities now for, you know, individuals that have allergies or mm. some issues, you know, with, with a certain type of food. But at the end of the day, it's good for the customers and it's also good for the restaurants because, you know, now we can provide something special to our guests. Yeah. Uh, meaning that, for instance, if someone comes with an allergy, of course, you know, we do our best to make sure that, you know, we, we, we look at other different allergies that a person might have. So someone says, oh, I got a peanut allergy. Okay, fine. You know, what can we do to, you know, make sure that there's no peanuts, right? Mm. Peanut oil, using a, you know, certain pan to cook it in. But more importantly, if someone has, maybe they're a vegan or, you know, vegetarian or gluten-free, all of that stuff, you know, we do have menus that may deal with that. But at the same time, what we like to do is to create individual menus. Ah, wow. You know, to to ask, I guess, uh -huh. you know, what are you allergic to? What can you eat? Mm. What can't you eat? Uh -huh. You know, and, and, and let me make a menu for you for tonight yeah you know, wow let, let me make a dish for oh. you or if you want two dishes let me make two dishes if you want three we'll make mm -hmm. three that's wonderful but you know to personalize it so that they feel that they're getting something special rather than a pre-made menu uh, -huh. uh that someone's going to say oh if a vegan comes in we're going to give them this mm -hmm. or if somebody that's that's this you know we're going to give them that mm. you know it's, it's kind of nice to kind of give them that personal treatment and say hey listen you know let us do something for you tonight. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. We have a menu here, but you know, that's not what we want to do. Yeah. Love you, that. You know, I, I, you know, tell me what you want and, and, and what you feel comfortable or, you know, I mean, what's going to make you happy tonight? Mm. And then and there let's, we go. Let's, let's make a, me a menu that's going to make you happy. Yeah. So, you know, as we get ready to wrap up, <laughs> you've built quite an empire. How are you balancing personal life? And business life, even though I know they overlap too. But how are you? How are you managing this? I mean, my God, Roy, you're very busy. You got a lot happening. <laughs> yeah, a lot happening. But you know what? At the end of the day, it's. Uh, I mean, I enjoy what I what I do. Uh -huh. You know, I've been very very fortunate to find something in life that I really enjoy doing. Yeah. So so working a lot is is not a problem. Of course, you know, you end up having a family, and you have you know you got to take care of that need. But you know, I try to balance a time out where you know I can spend. And, you know, do this and do that with the kids or, you know, to uh, older kids and younger kids. And, you know, you try to do what you can. And, uh, you know, I try to focus in. So I'll be honest with you. When I get home and if I'm home, um, I make sure that I don't answer emails. Uh, or I don't, I don't turn it all it, off you know, when you're there. Focus, right? That I don't use the phone. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's it's to me, it's important that I that I that I be that way. Mm. I imagine you're cooking at your own home or. Oh, yeah. I, I always make it a point where, you know, if, for the kids, uh, you know, I, 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 what do you want to eat? You know, and I make that. And, uh -huh. you know, it's it's <laughs> I enjoy doing it. You know, I mean, yeah. It's, you yeah. Know. I would enjoy being your kid in the house eating. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, so, you know, kind of last question. Uh, I mean, you're still relatively young. Do you what are your do you have any more? Let's call it aspirations or, or dreams or or. What what are you thinking about for the future? Are you thinking of the future? You know what? Um, I'll be honest with you. You know, when I was younger, uh, you know, I I, I couldn't. I, I I was always trying, trying, and, and trying to get somewhere. And and today, I'm more about making sure that what I have, I want to make sure that I continue to refine it to make it better. Mm. So so I work hard at trying to make something better each day. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and for me, I can't wait. To get up in the morning and go to work. Yeah. You know, I get up in the morning uh, and, and I just can't wait to just try and make a difference in, in, in the things that I have in life. And, if, and that's the restaurants, taking care of the kids, uh, you know, 
doing something better for the community but you know you know it's it's about but first of all it's about you know it, it, it's 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 who that are around me you know at you know of course on a day-to-day basis of course it's family and of course it's um it's it's the people that i work with on a day-to-day basis and at the same time with doing that of course it trickles down to making a great a better experience for our guests yeah um but aside from that you know you know cooking it definitely has been my life mm. and 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 um things that relate to cooking is you know what i always look to do more of yeah. you know so and i've been fortunate that you know our brand has a a a, a pretty strong name and value to it mm-hmm. and you know we're always asked to to you know do something you mm-hmm. know whether it be a guest chef or whether it be to open another restaurant or you know whether to to do an event or you know things like that so you know i'm i'm very blessed and i'm very happy that you know um i'm given the opportunity to stay relevant and i think yeah. that's the word i think i think to me being relevant is more important than making money mm. I, I think to be relevant for instance you know i i had a call today and someone said you know by the way um i want to ask you something about you know um miso yeah uh, i you know i want to ask you something about uh some japanese food okay because they told me that i should be asking you for this hmm. Got you know, it. So, so yeah. to me, being relevant to what I do in this business and making a difference with that, mm-hmm. you know, whether it be in your industry or your community, I think you know, to me, it's pretty, pretty, pretty exciting. <laughs> well, well, right. Well, thank you so much for sharing with me, and also the the two in my two trips to Maui here, the meals that I've had here. I mean, I have been an experience, and sitting with you is an experience. So, thank you. This oh, has I been a blast. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Thank you very yeah. much for the opportunity. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Roy as much as I enjoyed recording it. I really had a blast with him. We had a good time. Um, Be sure to check out the show notes at our website at theweddingbiz.com and be sure to listen to The Next Level that was released today as well that goes with this episode in in which my co-host and I break down some of the highlights of it and help you to really deliver it in terms of how to raise your business to the next level. And be sure to share this episode if you like it and if you love it, please review it. And I want to mention that next week's guest is going to be the photographer, Christian Oth. What a conversation. It, he was so open. Be sure to tune in next week. You can find us and contact us at theweddingbiz.com and on social media at Wedding Biz Show. See you next week. Oh.